video makes it hyper real is what it does. It does. I love to be hyper real. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do a podcast then. Let's do it. Now that we all know what one is. Here. <laughs> Here we go. A minuscule portion of the Daily Tech News Show was brought to you by me. Because I went to patreon.com slash acedetect and donated a dollar a month to a podcast that I really enjoy. Won't you join me? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 11th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt, and I'm very happy to have Nate Langson back on the show, editor of Wired.co.uk. How's it going, Nate? Oh, it is going so well. I've been looking forward to coming back on this show for a while. It has well, been too long. It has. All my daily emails. Tom, let me back on. I've got stuff to say. Let me back on. You finally relented and let me on. I, yes, I finally undid the block, uh, the spam filter. Yes, <laughs> and let you back on. No, I man, I, I've been look, I've been looking forward to this. I, I've I've been uh, waiting for your schedule to free up and my schedule to match, and and he, we are here. So Very let's excited. not delay. Let's talk about some headlines. The New York Times spoke with three Apple employees about a training program known as Apple University. Steve Jobs started the program back in 2008 and hired the dean of Yale's School of Management to head it, and he still heads it now. Classes are described using things like Picasso's The Bull to illustrate simplification. Classes are taught year-round and tailored to particular positions within the company. Yeah, when I first saw this, actually, I think that um, a lot of people have criticized the comparison to Picasso as a bit pretentious, possibly. But actually, if you look at the drawings, they were comparing it on the New York Times piece, I think, to um, uh, the Apple mouse and the evolution through the era. And actually, it makes a lot of sense as a metaphor. Uh, they're quite they're quite similar. But I really want these courses to come out on iTunes U at some point, because that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I don't think you're ever going to see that happen, though. This is this is no. the pinnacle of the insidery Apple like special sauce that they don't want anyone else to have access to. They're famously closed about that. But I agree with you about the bull thing. It's not that they're comparing themselves to Picasso so much as they're using how Picasso found the form of the bull as a, an example of simplification. And that, that does make sense to me, yeah. CNET reports Intel's long-delayed 14-nanometer Broadwell chips are finally in significant production. Intel said the first systems using Core M, that's the lowest power Broadwell variant, will hit store shelves during the holiday season. And Kurzanich said, I don't mean the last moment in the holidays. I mean for the holiday season. Most Broadwell powered devices aren't going to come until 2015, though. The Core M enables less than 9 millimeter fanless 2-in-1s for the first time from Intel. Uh, so they're talking super thin, super long battery life. Uh, they say Core M is 50% smaller, 30% thinner, and has a 60% lower power idle than Haswell processors. Yeah, and it comes on a very interesting time because today we just saw the Chromebook from Acer, I think, that might be discussed later, um, which has the new NVIDIA Tegra K1 chip in it, uh, which is also very, very low power, very cool. Um, but um, for me, the Broadwell stuff, I think it's coming next year that it gets really exciting. That's why I'm not upgrading my MacBook this year. My MacBook yeah, is. definitely after the first of the year when we see this starting to show up in other uh, laptops and, 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 and even desktops. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm actually more excited about the full Broadwell you know, i5s and i7s, uh, or at least as excited as I am about the Core M. Yeah, the next web reports Google has joined an effort to create a trans-Pacific cable system called Faster. Good name. By Q2 2016, Google joins China Mobile, International China Telecom Global, Global Transit, KDDI, and Singtel, with NEC as the system supplier for the $300 million project. Faster will feature six fiber pair cable and optical transmission with expected capacity of 60 terabits per second, connecting the west coast of the U.S. with Chikura and Shima, Japan. No... Nate, you can't have the 60 terabit connection to your house. That's I have a 156 megabit connection to my house right now. That's why I look so glorious on this HD video screen. <laughs> and why your face looks so vibrant in my face. Yes, exactly. GigaOM reports Microsoft announced the Nokia 130 Monday. Yeah, they get to use the Nokia name for a while longer before they have to give it back to what's left of Nokia. Uh, it's on sale for 19 euros. That's about 25 bucks US. The candy bar style handset runs Nokia OS, not Windows Phone, and can play music and display videos on its 1.8 inch screen. 
Yeah, I'm really quite um, intrigued by this because Nokia has sold so many of these super low powered, super low cost devices. And in a Microsoft ownership world, particularly in the devices side of things, this to me strikes me as something that has been in the pipeline for quite a while. And they're just letting it get out there because it won't need much maintenance. It has no internet, for goodness sake, um, rather than an indication, as I've read a couple of people say on the blogs, that uh, Microsoft's you know, sticking to the Nokia strategy that it's purchased. I'm not convinced yet. No, I I have a feeling that this was so far into the works and so so much of a de of a no brainer as far as sales. I mean, like there must be carriers already signed up like to snap this thing up and give it yeah. away for free at that price. Uh, that they, that Microsoft was like, yeah, we'd be stupid to kill this. We might as well go ahead and put it out there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's probably worth more to their business relationships almost than it is to their margins. But keep the Microsoft name off of it. It's the Nokia 130, and we'll just pretend like it came out before we acquired the handset business. Yeah. Something like that. Huawei told Shanghai's China Business News that the company plans to phase out more than 80% of its low-end mobile phones in the second half of this year. Huawei says the majority of low-end phones it makes are for carriers. It's the problem for Huawei, and not because of customer demand. So Huawei intends to focus on branding its own models. I think you're going to see a lot more Huawei phones instead of phones made by Huawei with other brand names on them. Uh, and they've been doing a lot more e-commerce sales of their, their handsets as well. Hmm. Reuters reports Xiaomi rolled out a software upgrade Sunday to fix a loophole in its cloud messaging system that triggered unauthorized collection of data from users' contacts. Uh, as Xiaomi Vice President Hugo Barra apologized for the unauthorized data collection and said the company only collects phone numbers in users' address books to see if the users are online. The messaging system now, however, will be opt-in so that you get to choose whether you like that behavior or not. And it will only send numbers to Xiaomi's servers encrypted and promises not to store them. Time for some news from you. These are things submitted on our subreddit at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Uh, get in there and, and just play around. Do some voting. Submit some URLs if you feel like it. There's lots of good stuff in there, uh, and it helps us put the show together, not just in this News From You section, but the whole show uh, all together. Mike P. Kennedy is a uh, regular submitter. He sent the Engadget story that Acer announced a new 13-inch Chromebook. That's the one Nate was mentioning earlier. Has a 1080p HD display, a claim of 13 hours of battery life, and runs that quad-core Tegra K1 chip from NVIDIA, Nate mentioned. Uh, that makes the $299 laptop the first Chromebook with an NVIDIA processor inside. A lot of people are intrigued by that, Nate. Yeah, I'm particularly intrigued by this, but there's a, a, an interesting detail here is that there are a couple of models available. One has a higher screen resolution than the other, and the one with the higher resolution, because it needs more power, um, it actually has a slightly reduced battery life. Um, so you're kind of being faced with this choice of do you want a higher resolution HD screen, sort of a full AD, HD resolution, or do you want a greater battery life um, at the cost of the pixel density. So um, I think it's an interesting, it's going to be an interesting marketing move to see how that is uh, pitched to people buying this. But either way, I mean, in the UK, it's going to cost just over 200 pounds, which is an absolute bargain in our market as well. I'm sure it is in the States. Um, so pretty exciting. Yeah, it's about $100 uh, cheaper in the US than the Samsung version, which is a, a similar model there. So definitely aggressive pricing. And, and mm. I guess that's always the case. You're always trading off battery life for resolution because that's just how physics works but i i do th see what you mean about this is a very clear choice between the two models they have yeah definitely d broadback posted the wired article by matt honan reporting his experience after liking everything he saw on facebook for two days uh annoying his friends in the process after the first hour of the experiment the humans were pretty much gone from his newsfeed, he said, content mills rose to the top. Everything was about brands. Uh, his feed was filled with Huffington Post and Upworthy at one point. He talks about having uh, having liked, because he was like, I'm going to like everything no matter what. His only exception was a death announcement from a friend of his who had, whose mother had died. He's like, I'm not going to cross that line. I'm not going to like that. But he liked everything else, including a story about Gaza, which sent a bunch of right-wing stuff into his feed. But he was also liking other stories, which were sending a bunch of left-wing stuff into his feed. It was a mess. Uh, but the unexpected collateral damage were his friends. It also littered their feeds with streams of him liking all of this stuff. 
Yeah, I really like one of the conclusions in his uh, couple of his closing paragraphs where he said that uh, an old wired editor, John Bradley, actually had asked him if he'd been hacked. And another friend, said, another friend said, my Facebook feed is literally full of articles you like. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, no friend stuff, just Honan likes. But, um, <laughs> he yeah. stopped after two days, not because that had been his plan all along. It, it sounded like he was just like, I, I can't do this anymore. This is, this is ridiculous. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think the Facebook like algorithm is built to expect that sort of behavior. No, I mean, whenever I mean, I sort of like these kind of um, uh, these sorts of stories, but I think you know, when somebody is is making a, a a experiment smoothie, I need to be able to suck some science out of it, and I'm not sure what new science I got to swallow on this day. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting experiment. I get what you're saying, but did we yeah. learn anything? Huffington Post posts a lot on Facebook. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. But it's a really fun experiment. It's very well written, as, as Matt's stuff yeah. tends to be. It's, it's definitely well worth the read, even it's, if I it's say a good so read. as a colleague yeah. of his. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, that's true. He is at Wired US. You're at Wired UK. So yeah. you guys have to say nice things about each other, right? Isn't that it's contract? Yeah. Yep. And that's a look at the headlines. <laughs> well, I agree with you. It's a good read. Matt's a great writer. Uh, real quick, want to remind people about Alpha Geek Radio. Uh, if you are listening to this show on Alpha Geek Radio, you already know about it. But if you don't, we stream the show in audio live every day, Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 Pacific. Uh, and you can listen along with us. We always start a little bit before the show and we leave it streaming a little bit after. So you get to hear some of the pre-show and post-show as well. Alpha Geek Radio does that for tons of shows out there. Uh, they've got a great stable of things from the Frog Pants Network, from the Diamond Club folks like us, uh, and fr from all over the place. Allison Sharon has her, her Pod Feet podcast on there now as well. Uh, so go check it out, alphageekradio.com. And if you like what you see, I highly encourage you to support them on Patreon at patreon.com slash alpha geek. And thanks to Todd Whitehead and everything uh, he does at Alpha Geek Radio to make that possible. We've got a battle on our hands, Nate. Hachette yes. versus Amazon. Yes, a, the sword a, versus the laser, as it were. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Uh, I'm not sure which one's which, actually. I guess Amazon's the laser in that? Because uh, uh, they have the tech. Yeah, Amazon, I think, is the sword. I think because they want to just slice the prices. Is that <laughs> um, yes? Although you could also argue that a sword is a metaphor for an old business model because swords mm. aren't as modern as laser. The yeah, right. Publishers. Um, I don't know. Well, if you've you've probably heard about this in the peripheral, if if not read about it directly, Amazon and Hachette are having a dispute over how much Amazon will charge for Hachette's eBooks, particularly. Uh, to give you a little background, Hachette settled price fixing charges in April of 2012. Uh, so they didn't go to court. They weren't guilty, although Bezos in his letter, or actually Amazon, I don't think it was signed by Bezos, uh, implied that they were guilty. And then that's probably fair, but they didn't actually go to court. Uh, they implemented a Department of Justice settlement in September of 2012, which means they agree to allow all retailers to discount eBooks up to 30% for two years. All right, so that means that settlement is up in September of 2014. That's what Amazon and Hachette are negotiating. Now there's a separate deal where Apple was found to have colluded with these publishers like Hachette uh, and they were put on the ability to discount any amount they wanted and in two years had to renegotiate individually. Now their settlement came later, so they will start renegotiating first with Hachette in October 2015. That's why Amazon picked Hachette because they know that Apple has to renegotiate with each publisher in six month blocks. Hachette will be the first one Apple renegotiates with. So Amazon is using that to their advantage saying, hey, we wanna get this deal done before you have to go into Apple and you probably want that done too so that you know what the ground is gonna look like when you go to renegotiate with Apple. Amazon wants the unlimited discounting power that Apple has. They want cheaper wholesale prices too uh, and it's this difference between the wholesale and the agency model. What the publishers like is to say, the book is this much. We'll let you do discounts from time to time, but we really want you to sell at the price we print on the cover or in the ebook world, the price that you list on the page. The list price is the price. The wholesale model says, we'll charge you this much for the book and you can price it however you want. We'll still have a suggested retail price, but you're not beholden to that. Uh, Amazon is playing hardball. They've taken away fast shipping. 
All Hachette titles take the full time. You can't do priority. You can't do two-day shipping with them. Uh, they've removed discounts from many uh, titles. They've taken away pre-orders for a lot of popular titles. And so, Nate, here's, how, here's where we get to the battle. 900 authors, most of them not from Hachette, signed a letter that was published in the Sunday New York Times, and it's also available at authorsunited.net, asking readers to email Jeff Bezos and say, your practices in this negotiation are hurting authors. They're not hurting Hachette. They're hurting the authors. Please stop. Amazon sent out a preemptive email Saturday, which they also posted on their own website, readersunited.com, asking readers to send an email to Michael Pesch at Hachette. Uh, saying you guys are the greedy ones because you want higher book prices. Uh, Amazon's also in a similar dispute, by the way, with the German publisher Bonnier, and the publishers in Germany have actually filed an antitrust complaint against Amazon. So, all right, Nate, we've got two titans, uh, one of, of the old guard, one of the new guard, fighting over book prices. How does that make you feel as a reader? Well, um, as a reader... Um... I suppose it makes me feel indifferent presently because I don't feel I have been on the receiving end of any of either of these arguments asking me to join in their battle on their behalf. I like to stay on the fence in, in, this, in this case. Um, but as an observer, unless you're going to ask me how do I feel as an author um, after this, but okay, I am. I'm just trying to read, I'm trying to read your body language in the camera. Am I going to get asked as an author? Maybe. Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'll ask you that for sure. Okay, well, as an, as an author, I, I'm not an author as such, um, so I have, have probably no comment. Um, but what I do disagree with to begin with is this trying to drag customers, fans, uh, supporters, and what have you into the battlefield in some sort of, um, you know, almost like cannon fodder. Like, the fact is, if you're a fan of Amazon and you hate the old model, chances are if Amazon asks you to go in and do your bidding, kind of like when... If Lady Gaga or Justin Bieber or any of the sort of topless celebrities go onto Facebook and say, hey, guys, can you go and like this? I really like this. Chances are their fans are going to like this. They're not necessarily going to read both sides of the argument because if they're going to like it straight away, it's a sign they're inherently lazy. Um, that can happen on both sides, yes, but I don't think it's a fair way to pitch um, two businesses against each other. Um, so I kind of think that all that is just a lot of really annoying um, fluff that should just be gotten rid of. I think Amazon's about it. I think Hachette's about it. They should stop dragging us into this battle. However, yeah. hang on. Am I jumping ahead of your questions? No, go ahead. Jumping? Keep going. Okay. So the second part of this um, sort of rant here is that I am on both Amazon and Hachette's side at the same time, but for very, very different reasons. On Hachette's side, I do think that they are playing hardball in a way that is trying in whatever way you want to justify it, to prevent happening to books what we've seen happen to music, which is that they become a commodity um, that can be treated uh, you know, as kind of marketing material at best, which is how a lot of it seems to be. I don't have many friends that are authors. Yourself is an exception and a couple of others, but I have a lot of friends who are musicians. I don't mean that as a brag. It's just that I get to hear a lot about this stuff um, from the artist's mouth rather than the record label's mouth and even sometimes from the labels. And they are struggling to make a living. They're moving back in with them as you know, grown men and women, and they are really struggling to um, to make a decent living, even though they've sold, in some cases, 100,000, 200,000 records. Um, they're trying to stop that happening with books, and I think that that's a good thing. I don't agree with their methods. Amazon, on the other hand, is trying to get a better deal for readers. That's great, but we've seen what that happened. Ha we've seen what happens when Spotify and things do that. They were competing with piracy. That's not necessarily resulted in a great deal for the musicians, but it has made the fan very, very happy. So. If you can tell from this, I'm ambivalent but angry, which is a very weird collection of emotions to feel about the same thing. I'm kind of the same way, although I, I guess I had been characterizing it as saying I'm on neither of their side because neither of them are on my side. Uh, this Amazon email kind of tripped my trigger on Sunday because they sent it to me as a Kindle Direct author. I, I published some stuff on Kindle Direct. I do not like Kindle Direct. And let me be clear. I am a fan of Amazon in many ways. I think they're very innovative. I think as a retail site, they're fantastic. I think they're doing some great things in enterprise and storage, and, and, and there are good things they do, and there are bad things they do. They're a company. Of course, that's going to be true. So them trying to rally me to their side with some moralistic email, which tried to invoke George Orwell by misquoting him, or at least out of context quoting him, if not directly misquoting him, uh, just rubbed me the wrong way. I don't like Kindle Direct because I have published a book in lots of different places. I believe in making stuff available in as many places as possible. And Kindle has a special promotion where you have to give Amazon exclusivity and pull all those other versions back 
uh, in order to get a better royalty rate for them and promotion. And I'm I'm like, I make Creative Commons free versions of things available. I can't pull those back. And they're like, well, then you can't really take part in this plan. Uh, that's horrible. And so you're telling me Hachette's this horrible, evil publisher who wants to drive prices up in order to help you take control of the publishing market from them. I'm not saying Amazon's right. I'm not saying Hachette's right. I'm not saying either one of them are wrong, but I am not on your side. You're not on my side. So don't try to turn this into some sort of moralistic, Amazon is just trying to defend the readers with lower prices. Amazon calculated, and they admit this very clearly, that prices at this level will, make, will sell the most books. And what they're trying to do with Hachette is get the right to put the price at that optimal level and drive the wholesale price down so they can make more money and, and squeeze the profit margins of Hachette. Hachette is like, well, we don't want our profit margins squeezed. We also don't want Amazon to get too much power in the situation, as Nate pointed out, and, and control the marketplace to where you know, you're not making that money. And Hachette trying to, is trying to do this not because they care about the authors, although maybe they do, uh, but if, the, if Hachette doesn't win, it's the authors who are going to suffer. So we're all going to lose depending on how this comes out, whether we're readers or authors, somebody's going to get the shaft and it's not going to be the executives at either one of these companies. And that, listeners, is a rant from a reader and then another rant from an author. <laughs> We've got bookended rants today. You've got, that, that's called editorial um, balance right yeah. there. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the George Orwell thing is hilarious because you can use a lot of Orwell's quotes, and I, I'm a, a big Orwell fan, um, to, to really argue anything if you just change a couple of words. You could argue that, um, I don't know, Bezos saying it's a beautiful thing, the destruction of margins. And you can imagine Hachette saying, if you want a vision of the future, imagine Amazon stamping on a human face forever or something yeah, like that. You absolutely. can twist these and it's, it's, quite, it's quite fun to do that. The fact is they're both as bad as each other, depending on which angle you come at it for. And certainly my earlier argument slash rant, that was me suggesting that I agree with what they're both doing is that there, are, there, there is merit on either side um, that is supposed to benefit readers or authors or, or, or the fact is is that they do it to such extremes either incredibly high prices and, and old business models or uh, completely crushing um, margins that sort of um, push towards potentially making authors or rather the books some sort of a, a commodity that, that can't be replicated like bands have been able to do to a certain extent with things like 360 deals and gigs and merch. Um, there aren't that many people walking around in, in Game of Thrones t-shirts I've noticed despite the popularity of that book. So it's not like people are able to, to do that. You don't see George R. R. Martin giving stage talks, you know, 200 nights a year um, reading live versions of his book. Maybe that's the future. Maybe that is the future. Maybe in you know five years' time, you and Veronica will be on stage doing dramatic readings of Sword and Laser publications. I don't know. Yeah, but, maybe. Um, I, and to be honest, I mean, and Martin, the authors do that. I've seen Martin do that. But you're right. He they they do it in promotion of selling the book. That's uh, what I mean. It's not kind of you know with, with bands, the equivalent would be they release an album, and that is simply promotion. It's marketing material. Get it out as widely as possible. Um, so that people come to your gigs and they pay a ticket price, they you know pay the venue, the promoter, what have you, and then they sell some merch off the back and and that sort of stuff. And they take bands with them. You know these days it's not uncommon to see three support bands on trying to to do that, and um, and they can do that. But you know he's not he's barely got time by the looks of it to write you know the next book in the series. It's been how long? Five years, six years. He hasn't got time to do two hundred stand up nights a year to to keep himself in business. So. I don't know. This is all a very long-winded, off the top of my head kind of rant um, about this, and um, I don't know how it's going to go, and I don't really want to predict it. I just hope that books don't necessarily go the same way that uh, music has gone, in that it is so cheap and so easy to replicate and distribute um, that it makes it really difficult for authors to um, to support their work because the last thing you want to do is that a lot of intelligent people who don't see that, that there's an opportunity for them to make money, they're just going to go and apply that somewhere else. Smart people do that. They just apply their talents and their intellect in other areas. And if they're not putting that into books because it's not worth their time, um, then that's a real shame for everybody. And, um, and I really hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, I, I don't 
fear that so much because I feel like people write for many different reasons, not just uh, the ability to make money. And if in fact you talk to most authors, they're like, yeah, you don't write because you want to make money at all because you can't make a lot of money writing even, even before this sort of dispute. But at the same time, I want it to be fair. Uh, and the fact that Amazon cannot promote J.K. Rowling's book for pre-order means that they've got a very comfortable margin to spend here. They've got a lot of power here. The fact that, can Hesh that Hachette can dig in and deal with the largest retailer on earth not promoting their books, not doing the things that will drive up sales, means that Hachette you know, really has the, the comfort to be like, yeah, this is too important. We, we need to lose that money and we can afford to lose that money right now in order to make the stick. I think this is a very important fight and whoever wins or whatever decision they come to is really going to set the tone for all the other negotiations with all the other publishers and set the way eBooks work for us, the consumer, for the next five to six years. And the rest, I think, as well. But but I have two questions. And in that case, I mean, uh, there are a lot of sort of mom and pop bookstores around, well, they're around the world. Um, are they going to be cheering at this? Because if you can't buy the new J.K. Rowling book from Amazon, which sells, I think, something like 40% of all new books in the U.S., I think it's higher in the U.K. Um, and does that not mean that a lot more books from Hachette authors now can be bought from, I mean, even Barnes & Noble or what have you, but... If you can't buy it from Amazon, maybe you will nip down the road and buy it from the independent store. Or you just won't buy it question. at all. I think that's what Amazon is counting on is that the, it's not just the availability, it's the trouble. Amazon can deliver it to your door and the local bookstore won't. Uh, because they are telling people, if you want this book sooner, go somewhere else. They're, 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 they're calling the bluff on that, uh, which means Amazon isn't too worried about it. Go ahead with your second question. But what I think that could be great, though. I mean, even as a PR thing, it could be it should be jumped upon maybe by the independent bookstores to say, hey, look, this is an opportunity for us to band together and say, hey, you don't like what's happening there. Buy it from us. Sell it to them half price. Get them in your doors, because that's what makes a book shopping experience good. My second my second question would be, though, um, was just to question your point about um, it not being about making money. I mean. Surely it's about making money to a certain extent. Otherwise, authors wouldn't be so up in arms about it. I was, I was sort of tongue in cheek there. Uh, authors okay. saying you certainly don't write because you want to get rich. Um, uh -oh, okay. But yes, no, I, 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 you're right to correct the implication that I might have accidentally made that authors don't want to make money. Of course they do. That's that's what I thought you meant because um, it's it's it, it, I was going to make the, the the sort of comparison that it's the same for a lot of uh, musicians and that's myself included who write music and play music because it's a very good way of either expressing yourself or um, because it's just a hobby and now it's easy for you to distribute. Um, some bands do make some money, but a lot of very well-known bands that you'll have seen headlining festivals have day jobs. Uh, all right, maybe not Metallica, but the festivals I go to, let's put it that way, um, they still have day jobs. Um, but yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it's right for them to be to be questioning this, but um, I don't know. I don't know who's going to win, and I don't know when. All right, let's check the calendar. EA's new subscription service is now available to all Xbox One owners starting today. Not just the beta folks anymore. Service gives you, if you don't remember, unlimited access to select EA games for five dollars a month or thirty dollars per year. Also, today is a birthday for Steve Wozniak. Happy birthday, Waz, and also Shinji Mikami, uh, who grew up to become video game designer for Capcom and work on Resident Evil. You can thank him for Resident Evil, so a couple of cool birthdays there. And Lockheed Martin uh, is uh, set, they has set the launch of Digital Globe's high-resolution Worldview 3 satellite for August 13th. Why do you care? Well, its creators can start selling extra sharp pictures with detail down to the 10-inch level. Uh, six months after the craft is up and running. So this is a result of private companies being allowed to put up satellites at this resolution to provide better quality maps for things like maps, uh, better quality pictures. And I'm particularly excited about this because one of my favorite hobbies is bedtime browsing of Google Maps over North Korea. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> Anything that helps me explore that place a little bit better. And Did you see it. that uh, tourist video, that high-speed video that was oh, made? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Insane. I mean, definitely filtered, but still very interesting to see what even the filtered view looks like, for sure. Yeah. Our pick of the day comes from you, Nate Langson. Uh, you've been uh, sucked into Elder Scrolls Online. Now, I've heard a lot of people criticize it, but you're loving it. Oh, I absolutely love it. I mean, I, I agree with 
um, with the, some of the people who criticize it because there are two camps of people that would definitely uh, want to criticize it. You know, this is for anyone who doesn't know the sort of big online version of the Elder Scrolls game like Skyrim, Oblivion, and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's been out since about April time, I think. And um, some of the people who don't like it are the hardcore MMO fans, the Warcraft players, um, you know, the um, Linz and Dota, that sort of thing, where it's all about these big groups and, and, uh, and team stuff. And then the other people who don't necessarily like it are the people who just want that hardcore single player experience that something like Skyrim delivers, which is very, very well crafted for one person to go through and explore. Um, let's call them 10% each and get rid of them. They're right into thinking it's not for them. But it does mean there's this big portion of people in the middle of that who want a game that's a lot like Skyrim, but they just want some of the benefits of, um, of the MMO world, which is being able to group with people if you want. And then the opposite is true. People who like MMOs, but actually they want a bit more kind of story, fully voiced actors and all that kind of stuff. That's what this is. And it's basically, I think my last count is it sucked just over 400 hours of my life since it was released. No um, kidding, just since April. It wow. really is. Yeah, some people smoke, some people do drugs. I do sure. all the scrolls online because I don't do the other two, so I feel like I'm owed an addiction. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm super into it. So if anyone's listening and wants to play with me on the EU server, I am Langson 101 do uh, come questing. Excellent. ElderScrollsOnline.com if you'd like to find out more. And you can send your picks to feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. And you can find my picks at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash picks. All right. Got a couple more messages uh, of the day, and then we'll be out of here. The first one is a call, actually an MP3, that Dave sent us regarding what's going on with Twitch and their crackdown on copyrighted music. Hey there, DTNS gang. Dave McDonald in Orlando here. On Friday's show, you discussed two policy changes at Twitch.tv. One about limiting archives and one about music licensing. Well, by day, I'm a mild-mannered music business professor, and my first thought was that these two things might actually be related. There are many different kinds of music licenses, some of which have fixed rates and some are more negotiable. The synchronization license, which would allow a creator to put music into a gameplay video on Twitch, is very flexible. Traditionally, when negotiating that kind of license with a publisher, they would want to know how long you're going to use it. So you'd pay more if you were licensing music for a TV ad that would run for four months than one that ran only one month. Perhaps Twitch is limiting its archives in exchange for lower licensing rates from publishers and labels. The metaphor between old-timey TV and newfangled user-generated on-demand digital video isn't perfect, but come on, when does that ever matter to an intellectual property lawyer? Fair point. Uh, no, I think that I think Dave may have hit on something. That would explain why Twitch is allowing music in the live streams, because Twitch is probably just paying a royalty to cover that. And that royalty would be a lot less because they're like, it's ephemeral. It goes out in a live stream and that's and then that's it. But the archives is where they would start to rack up the dollars. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be interesting to see how this changes with the uh, the YouTube acquisition. If um, there is a YouTube well, acquisition. if there is uh, an acquisition, It seems like yes. there is, but yeah, we don't yeah. know for sure. Uh, and then Dave wrote in and said, hi, Tom and Jenny. Jenny's off today, by the way, if anyone's wondering where Jenny Josephson, our producer, is. Uh, the head-up display discussed on Friday was provided by my car manufacturer. Okay, because he had said, I use a head-up display, and we were wondering which one it is. Uh, he says, it really is very useful showing my speed, turn-by-turn -turn directions, etc., while keeping my eyes on the road. I also have my phone connected through Bluetooth, which allows me to see and interact with a limited amount of information, like audio tracks and incoming calls, and that's it. I can't read text or email nor would I ever want to. I look forward to seeing third-party apps built into our cars. After all, Waze is more accurate than my in-car sat-nav, but there needs to be continued thoughtful consideration about what kinds of information drivers should be allowed to access. And thanks for the follow-up, Dave. Appreciate that. He posted that up on the blog at dailytechnewsshow.com if you want to find it. And that's it. Thank you, Nate Langston, for joining us. Wired.co.uk if you want to find uh, the products of Nate's efforts uh, and all of his elbow grease. And, of course, you can follow him at Twitter.com slash Nate Langston. Anything in particular coming up to let folks know about? Oh, just the fact that I'm going to show off my elbows and how covered they are in grease right now. Look at that. <laughs> You've been working so hard. I really have. No, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Um, yes, um, I suppose a couple of things coming up. The first thing I just want to highlight that our um, Wide UK podcast, which I host every week, is currently number one in the UK tech charts. And I don't mean that so much as a brag as I do a... Uh, 
just a little bit of verification that maybe if you like tech podcasting, uh, you might want to give it a check out. Um, we do cover stuff in science as well. So um, please do give that a look. And the other thing is uh, follow me on Twitter because that's what everyone says at the end of a podcast, isn't it? Yes. It's like it's, it's reputation currency. Nate Langson, some. spelled L-A-N-X-O-N. And where do they find, what's the name of the podcast again, just in case people missed it? Uh, if you just search for Wired UK Podcast, you'll find it uh, compatible with all of your favorite podcatchers. Excellent. And uh, I look forward to hearing you on there. I know we do share some fans, Tom. We have a few people who write oh, good. in. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Nate. Always a pleasure. Great conversation today, as I expected. <laughs> no, my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Bit, a bit ranty. But that is what you expect. So. I like that. Uh, also, thank you to our patrons, uh, 4,236 folks out there making the show possible. Uh, we've got some announcements to help you understand what you're doing uh, what, or what, what your contributions are helping us to do. We've also gotten a lot of people lately, more than I expected, just throwing in some 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 shekels in the uh, in the PayPal box as well. So sincere thanks for that as well. Uh, if you want to know about Patreon.com uh, or any of the other ways you can support the show, go to DailyTechNewsShow.com slash donate. Don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. Email us. Our email address is feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can call us. So we've got a number, 512-59-DAILY. You can listen to the show live, as I mentioned, at mobile.alphageekradio.com and visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. I'll be back tomorrow with Allison Sheridan of NosillaCast. See you then. This podcast is part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Amazing. There we go. Thank you, Nate. That was awesome. Power. No, my pleasure. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed oh, that discussion. Could you yeah. tell? <laughs> yeah. Given it's something I didn't know a great deal about when I woke up this morning, it's something I felt very passionate about once it got into the afternoon. Good, good. I like that. I actually really like to hear that because it's, it's wonderful when you come in with a topic that you're like all fired up about, but it's even better when it's something that you sort of, and then this one I've been following a little, but there are plenty of times when I come in and I see a topic and I, I'm like, what is this? And then the more you dig into it, the more either inflamed or interested or whatever you get. Yeah, that was that's exactly it. It's um, it's just one of the one of those things. I'm, I'm a big a big lover of books, and uh, you know, I, I there's I, I I tend to I often write to my favorite authors um, if they've got a new release out. I tend to write to them and uh, and just say, you know, thanks for the great work. Really enjoyed it, and it always seems to make a, a real difference to them. I mean, they I always get a reply. Very, I've noticed that rarely. too. I, I yeah. don't. I don't do it as often uh, as I should, probably. But every once in a while, I'll get it into my head. Like, gosh, I really want to thank them for this amazing experience. Yeah, and they absolutely. always write back. Definitely. I mean, I, I mostly read um, sort of nonfiction stuff, and it's usually like either, you know, world affairs stuff, a lot of stuff about um, Japan, East Asia, and, and that sort of thing. And um, the most recent, I wish I could remember the author's name now. Um, he's an FT journalist. Um, he writes from I think from the Beijing office. Um, and he wrote this amazing, amazing book um, about um, Japan post tsunami from a kind of an economic standpoint and a cultural standpoint. Um, but he also sort of used that as a almost as a hook to explain the history and evolution of Japanese culture. Oh, and wow. it was really interesting to sort of say, well, this is how it evolved, and then use the tsunami and the you know post tsunami um, sort of government crisis and social changes and stuff as kind of the and this is how. All of this has manifested itself. It was such an interesting read. I read the whole thing in about three days, something oh, wow. like that. And I just, you know, I, I just had to email him, and he just—he was so grateful to to hear that. So I thought. Well, I, I expect especially nonfiction authors get a lot less fan mail uh, than one might think. Uh, even fiction authors probably don't get as much as you know ce actual celebrities do. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's always. You know, it's the George R. R. Martins of the world. If you do know about a fiction author, those are the ones you, you tend to hear about. Yeah, definitely. Write your authors, people. Yeah. They like it. Let them know they're appreciated. Definitely. And as, as someone who's written a couple of books and self-published them, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about real authors. Self-published <laughs> is, is the same thing these days, though, right? Yeah, it is. One of these days, I'll, I'll write something that I feel proud enough to acknowledge. Well, I don't know. 
I, the, chronicle, the, 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 the chronology of tech history is getting pretty close. Oh, really? Good. I love those sorts of. I love historical stuff. We tend not to do any on Wired because we sort of we don't really do retrospectives. But sometimes I just I let us anyway because I kind of am too fascinated by it. Um, it's always been a bit of a fascination. Even when I was at CNET, my favorite articles to write were always the ones that were sort of tracing the evolution or the history of X, Y, Z. It's just and people have nation with them because they pick out the bits they remember, so they really sort of connect to it. So um, they uh, yeah, they're generally. Well, one advice. of the things that was extraordinarily helpful for me in making the chronology of tech history were the Wired US postings today uh, about oh, yeah, things that happened. So long. Yeah, Randy I remember Alfred there's a great one there about the well um, from like 1996 or something. It's still a fantastic read. Um, it, it really is. It's actually one of the defenses that we use for publishing the magazine online for free because the, the content is basically its own advertisement. If you've got a story from now nearly two decades ago, and frighteningly, that's all, almost as old, if not as old as the first Men in Black film, just to make us both feel quite old, <laughs> wow. is, um, you know, that archive is just so valuable for, for, you know, researchers. And we often get emails, people trying to quote and cite us in uh, school books and papers and stuff like that from ages ago. And certainly .com that's been around longer than we have. I'm sure that's even more common. Yeah, I used to use Hotwired uh, search engine. Oh, God, yeah. Wired. <laughs> oh, what were we thinking? Back in the day. It was good though, Hot Wired at the time. I remember Dogpile was my favorite one because it was the most useful thing with the most equal and opposite stupid name. Yeah. Like Dogpile, we all know what it's supposed to mean, and yet it was incredibly useful, which sort of undermines the ridiculousness of its title. Um, it was kind of like one of those meta search engines that searched the engines of other engines like ask.com and um, probably Alta Vista and those sorts of things. And it's still around, is it not? I think it I think it still exists Dog as a pile. I think so. I don't want as to get like, myself on a government watch list by searching this. Let me see. <laughs> I think it exists Please. as a as a sort of an indie search engine or a meta search oh, engine. You're right. Woof, yeah. it's the dog days of summer. Favorite searches, police shooting rights, new Iraqi PM, Gaza ceasefire. Okay, so it's quite political. Powered by Yahoo and Google. Yeah, it's, it's still doing the meta thing that it used to do, but it just kind of puts it all into it's It's more elegant than it used to be. Wow. God, I don't know. The, the company that owns it, the parent, is called Blue Cora, um, which is like a... If I'm, if I'm remembering right, I think one of their pitches, too, is that they don't do any of the tracking. They don't make you log in. They're not, you know, and so you can get Google search results through Dogpile without... Had been tracked by Google. So it's kind of like, sort of like DuckDuckGo, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. I think they're trying to, to, to yeah. be a, a little bit like that. It looks like Obviously, DuckDuckGo is the, the favorite. Yeah, but you know what? I'm so surprised that they integrated DuckDuckGo into iOS. That's like a default search option now. I know. That's great. I, mean, I love that. I, it's bizarre because DuckDuckGo is used for a lot of reasons that you can't use the other ones for um and for finding torrents specifically a lot of um torrent apps integrate DuckDuckGo. yeah whenever um, i need a linux iso that's exactly is what um, you're talking about right when, when yeah 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 when season four of um, linux is released in the <laughs> season us four of, of game of linux here, <laughs> and i don't want to know what the, the you know the extension endings are right right what you can do App um, to get the wall. Something like that. Uh, that's funny. Uh, good old Linux. Yeah, I was trying to right. avoid saying poor man's duck duck go when I was describing Dogpile, but I guess that's kind of what they... I don't know. I mean, one of them is owned by a big company. Who owns duck duck go? I don't know. I, I think duck duck go owns duck duck go. I think it's its own... I could, wrong. I could be wrong it. about that. I've not looked. No, I'm looking now about... Fascinated. I mean, these companies are run by a lot of people, but they're all pixelated out, which I'm sure is only a, uh, what's the word? Uh, Marketing. Supporting move. their public image, but oh, they yeah, got their it's propaganda. I mean, oh, if you actually, if you overlay it, you get You can see faces. them. So it's just for kicks. That's cool, actually. Yeah. That's funny. Oh, cool. Well, well done for doing a deal with Apple anyway. I mean, yeah. that's off. You're in the company of Google, Yahoo, and Bing. So, <laughs> you something, yeah. right? Could be worse. Is Ask in there too? Oh, Ask, I think he's in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
plus I guess once the extendability of, comes with iOS 8, you'll be able to put, um, you know, all of your favorite illigi- um, illicit search preferences, I guess, in there. That's become my uh, my new response because because Bing is good, uh, mm. but Bing Think doesn't it. have the market share of Google, and also. When you talk about things that Google does that aren't Google search, you call them Google. When you talk about things that Bing does that aren't search, you call them Microsoft. So people, sometimes you get fanboys saying, you never talk about Bing, you only ever talk about Google. And I respond, you only ever emailed me about Bing, you never emailed me about Ask. Yeah, that's true, actually, that's true. But I think that's kind of almost the the Google, Microsoft, Apple um, argument and the Android versus Windows versus Chrome, if you like rather than ask which doesn't does ask make much it powers a lot of stuff i think i think they they've got quite a um a decent back end that powers a lot of other systems but um i think that's how they survive actually yeah because yeah, i don't even I mean, see the marketing the search engine itself anymore it's like firefox i think firefox makes about 80 percent of its money from google yeah from being the default search box you know if google dropped that deal tomorrow firefox it would surely be on its last legs immediately the Mozilla um, Foundation would take a hit. I know that they do get money elsewhere besides Firefox, and oh, sure, so totally, you know, but they 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 they'd be able to adapt. But it would it would hurt. It would hurt. It would definitely hurt. I mean, one of the things I'm really interested about in the new iOS is whether there are going to be restrictions on um, things like pornography sites. You know, something Apple is extremely fiercely opposed to, um, for good reason. Once you think about it from a kind of family friendly. Um, perspective, but I, I just I wonder whether we're going to see any kinds of blocks on who can make extensions and who can set themselves as a um, oh you know a, we an app extension. It's it you know? we. It's going to be you can already write your template for that blog post right now. Oh yeah. Apple has blocked X extension, and we don't think they should because it's freedom of speech. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that'll be interesting. There's a lot of those companies, you know, they do a lot with tech, and um, they're quite proactive in, uh, in in creating stuff. And you would think that if they can suddenly create extensions to make apps work with a, you know, a, a pornography website, that they'd probably try to. And I can only imagine an Apple would try and stop them. Um, so it's going to be quite interesting to see how that works. Yeah. Cool. Well, I've got to go to bed. All soon. right, man. Well, thanks for um, hanging around, and uh, and definitely thanks for doing the show. When can we have you back? Um, whenever I'm um, I'm back on the podcast radar, so okay, any time cool. really. All right, um, we will be in touch. Fantastic. All right, man. Good stuff. I will catch you at a later date. Thanks again. Have man. a good night. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right, and I uh, I'm out of the post, me, since Jenny's not here to talk to you today. Um, but yes, I am going to. Post this podcast right now. I am, I am, I am. And then I'm going to go. So there you go. I might answer a couple questions in the chat room since it's just me right now, too. Let me make sure this posts properly. Be with you in a moment. Actually, just start throwing out some uh, some chat room questions. I did not say this. I just realized, but I chose Antitrust Prime as our as our title. I thought that was very clever, Mr. Whitehead. Uh, there's some other good ones in here too. How Shad clears a path through Amazon is is, is great. Uh, merit on either side. Let's see what you did there. Uh, the last symbiont's getting a lot of votes. That's interesting. Paperback Ranter, another good one. I like everything, yeah. But I, I went with Antitrust Prime, so I hope you're okay with that. But yeah, uh, throw in some questions in the chat room, and I'll answer a few of them here in a second. Make sure that this... Why you no take candle? Just throwing in some stuff. All right. Shekels. I try never to say shekels, and I said shekels on the show today. Uh, All right. Boxers or briefs, asks BioCow. Well... 
boxers. I, I was about to try to play coy and be like, that's a personal question, but really it's it's not. Tinenvec would like to hear the song Paperback Ranter uh, from The Battles. I think that I would probably receive a takedown request from The Battles at that point, since there's probably something like that that exists. Okay. R- or Ruddles. I think it was the Ruddles. Yeah, I think you're right. TV's gone. Well, there you go. Those are the only questions that made it in in the lag time. Uh, yes, it's Jenny J23 back tomorrow. Jenny Josephson is back tomorrow, back from her uh, her brief longish weekend. Looking forward to that. Uh, I will try to get the show notes up faster today than I did Friday, which was Saturday when I actually got them up. Um, she her secret sign uh, her secret assignment is over. Why do you try not to say shekels? Asks Tin and Vec. I just think it's kind of done. It's kind of over. Like it was funny in the seventies when people said it, uh, but now it's just just kind of it feels like you're telling a grandpa joke. I'm gonna say shekels instead of coins or dollars or something. No, God, she's not dead. <laughs> Secret assignment does not mean what you think it means. She's perfectly alive. Um, all right. Well, thanks everybody for hanging out and enjoying the show. And as I mentioned, Allison Sheridan tomorrow. We'll see you then.